Hello, welcome back to my channel Connect Reacts. I actually happened to have this video and I want you to watch it. Let's learn from Kenya protest by Professor Ike Chuku during this interview with the Chinese televisions. Yes, many Nigerians have been comparing this protest to the NSAS own and we all witnessed what really went down during the NSAS protest. Honestly, there's so much to learn from this Kenya protest but we need to understand what causes this protest in the first place. I believe understanding the main cause of a problem is one of the drivers in ensuring a possible solution. Please, just the way to stay connected to the end of this video, there is so much to learn, honestly. The demonstration started on the 18th of June, whereby Kenyans protested against proposed tax hikes, whereby the movement evolved into a wider campaign for more accountable governance in the country, in fact, leading to the demand of the entire government's resignation. Leading to the loss of lives, a lot of buildings were set on fire. Offices were destroyed, but according to reports, the president Ruto said the protest was hijacked by criminals, but fortunately, he later proposed a bill called Finance B. And on June 26, but why did the protesters mobilize to reject this finance bill? Sorry, I'm not trying to take much of your time, but we need to understand the root cause of this problem because that is exactly what we are facing in this country today. They said, government of the people, whereas the people in government only care about themselves. As long as they are in power, they don't care about what the people are facing or what they are doing. The people of Kenya rejected the bill due to the frustration they are facing because of fake promises to tackle high cost of living and the likes. But just like I said earlier, what are the lessons gained from these Kenya protests and how can Nigerians implement those methods in demanding for a better country or have we all agreed that truly division is the only way forward? This is what the professor said. Professor, okay, Ikechiko, please take a listen, very insightful speech and don't forget to like, share and subscribe. People were complaining in Kenya of one thing or the other, especially when when the government of the day now decided, well, you know what, you guys need to pay more taxes through the finance bill. And then the government, the people took over government, so to speak, and said, no, this has got to end. And that's what we have. In fact, I saw a video of a young lady who said, look, we understand taxing, we understand um, all these things that are necessary, but when the budget is heavy, the first thing you want to reduce or remove are what you call non-essential items. And for the young lady to have said that, she probably has looked at the budgets and to see the things that they, the people may have considered essential or non-essential. And there are lessons that you think we can identify from what happened in Kenya and if we have ever considered such a thing. Well, there are lessons, but let's, let's also put the issues in context. Mm. Kenya's um, debt stands at about $80 billion. It's dealing with it progressively. Now, three quarters of the country's economic output goes into the repayment of debts, in addition to 65% of its internally generated revenue. And remember that this um, tax thing that's leading to protests is part of the recommendations of the International Monetary Fund. There's a simple question on the table, and that's there in, in that there should be a lesson for us. When government is thinking of re raising revenue, is it that the best way to go about this is to tax the people? That's question number one. Question number two, it is time for all African countries to sit down and calmly ask themselves, looking back in the last 40 years, how many of the suggestions and interventions of the International Monetary Fund has led to real development, has led to people full cost interventions, <clears throat> has led to national, um, proper national self-management? Those are the issues because if you look at the poverty in Africa, look at the interventions of the World Bank, you look at the interventions of the IMF, you ask yourself, why is it that nations borrow in Africa Poverty increases, the debt increases, so the things for which the money is borrowed, you, you can't see it, and yet poverty is going on and on. So I thought I should give that background before coming forward to whether there are lessons for us. Now, the protesters, protests are not just about whether or not 
uh, so, sorry, staff. Prof. Well, if I can Is quickly quickly sorry. piggyback on on the issues that you just raised. Now, um, it's not like these issues are unique to Kenya. Even here in the country as well. I know we, we maybe we just talk about the lessons in the course of that of time. It's not that those issues are unique to Kenya. Okay. They also happen here in our country. And it is not like Kenya doesn't have natural resources. It's not like Kenya doesn't have human resources. So what is the genesis? It definitely isn't because the government came up with a finance bill, just that. It was that was just like some kind of camel the last straw that broke the camel's back that caused that kind of revolt or reaction from the people. So is it a problem of the people or a problem of governance over time? What exactly would you say was the history to it? We know the West would always want to do what the West would want to do because it's all about opportunities. So what do you think was the source or the crux of the matter over time or it was just a spontaneous thing? There's a question of what has been going on over time, but more importantly, if you look at most of the comments and reactions of those driving the protest, there are three key issues they are bringing up. The taxes are heavy, we are already taxed, and you're multiplying avenues where you will apply tax. So if you tax me, if you increase my income tax, you increase taxes on all the things I spend on, it's still coming from me. Now, the same people you're taxing are looking at the ruling elite, they are looking at uh, the expenditures on the government, on the presidential villa and the rest of it. You know, those are some of the issues mentioned, which made the president to indicate that, okay, we're going to cut here and there. The point is this. National resources are for national development. Now, development involves costs. That cost and the funding must come from somewhere. Now, the, the, the issue here is you want that money to come from taxation and from the people and the people are looking at the living standards and the it reflexes of those in office. Their privileges are on the increase. They are living in luxury. You can see that Kenyans are also putting up on X platform and many others all the signs of opulence among the ruling elite. So it's a growing perception of, look, we are being drained. Those around us are not sensitive. You say it's a government of the people, but it's looking more and more like the government of those in power to make themselves comfortable at the expense of the people. More importantly and more critically, Kenya has borrowed just like every other African country. The borrowings, what were they deployed to achieve? Are they achieving that? If Kenya implements the taxes it has in view, how will that affect the level of living? How will that affect poverty? How will that affect social security and the rest of it? So you find that initially the protests were rather peaceful. Okay, we don't want this, but over time, and as more and more material was getting into the social media about how the elite was living, how the political class was living, for the president, for Ruto to say, okay, he's going to cut down on, um, what do you call it, there will now be no budget for the office uh, for the president's wife, among so many other things. I think the cuts run into a billion something dollars. It tells you that this is a comprehensive response not organized by anybody who is just the opposition, by, but by, by aggrieved individuals who are citizens. But here is the danger. A protest, no matter how justified it is, if it is not led, it will degenerate into confusion. And we have the examples. You mentioned NSAS earlier. NSAS was a very timely response to the excesses of uh, SARS, which is um, a, a, an agency of the Nigeria police. But imagine that that protest lasted maybe for however long. You cannot rule Nigeria from a toll gate. There must always be organized uh, interventions. And it's interesting you said, yeah, in the past it's at least to revolutions, but today we are not sure what to make of it. Look around you. Everybody, at least sometime in the past, celebrated the Arab Springs. You know, it was a protest of the people that led to these governments being overthrown. overthrown. But the question to ask is, in those countries where it occurred, do they still have a country? You look at Libya, you look at Sudan. So whereas it is important to raise issues, object to obnoxious policies, demand accountability from the leadership, organized interventions are the solutions. They must be spearheaded. There must be specific demands. Like when the answer thing was going on, I recall I was, I think I was on this channel and you were also on air. And I made two or three specific suggestions. 
let the drivers of that protest indicate in clear terms a b c d two three four whatever it is they're asking for let them have representatives let there be a meeting with government let there be clear outcomes i'm not one to celebrate angry crowds people can get angry but a crowd becomes its own damage i mean its own enemy when he goes on i was on the garden editorial board during the june 12. there were june 12 riots nigerians were deeply angry about so many things until nadeko gave it a, a you know some kind of direction what happened was that as you are on your own driving on ikorodu road because you look a little healthier than the average person you get attacked that's not what we're looking for but are there lessons for us yes the lesson here and that's something for the ruling political and economic to note is this when suffering becomes unbearable, when people cannot pick their daily bills, when it becomes impossible for even the elite to be safe, it means that there are fundamental things government is, should be doing that is not doing. Today, MAs get kidnapped. Everybody in a fine car is in danger of becoming a victim. Serving generals get shot on the road, not because they are targeted, but is opportunistic criminality. That's not the kind of country we are talking about. Mm. So we are hungry, we are angry, everybody is unhappy. But a country must exist before you oppose the government governing it. Mm. And so whereas there are lessons, it's actually for the elite to begin to recalibrate its own reflexes. But, but, and when we speak of the elite, mm. usually... My, my apologies. Uh, we, uh, perhaps we're actually leading to it by not paying attention. Some of these things don't just happen. As you mentioned, Prof, history is there to learn from. It would seem like generally across Africa, we don't seem to learn from history. And secondly, we, are not even, we don't seem to be building for the future. Uh, um, there was, it was in the 80s that a young lady sang the song then. Uh, I think her name was Tosin Jegede. Parents, listen to your children. We are the leaders of tomorrow. We are the leaders of tomorrow is what we hear. And guess what? We are still calling them the leaders of tomorrow without giving them the reins of power. I also always say something, that the people who are in government today, who are in civil service today, in all, almost 1,500 ministries, departments, agencies, and corporations of government, were not in government 30 years ago. So it would seem like we are not passing on the torch. We are not, we're not communicating the future. As they come in, they, the orientation they get is that of opportunism, is that of uh, defending yourself, protesting, protecting yourself. It's like we have hurt in the past and we're still peeling the wounds of the past over time until now. So what do we need to do? How will the young people react when all they see is the things that you have described? Opulence and seeming wealth of people who may themselves be struggling. Well, for me, a lot of young people keep talking of how young they are until they discover they've turned old. If you're young and you say you're leader of tomorrow, you must ask yourself, what are the paradigms for tomorrow? Am I acquiring those paradigms? Do I know enough about my country? You see, we, mistake, we have a certain, um, if I like, delusional perception of the capacities and relevance of youth. As we speak, there are many young people who are in high places, Today, you will describe to me Tony Lumelo as belonging to the older generation, if not, I mean, middle between the very old generation and the young. Go and check Tony's record as a young man in his 20s and 30s. Go and check most other people's records. The thing we overlook is that you tell us, look, Nigerian youths got us independence. That is a fact. If you look at all those who fought for independence, they were very young people. They fought within the age bracket. What a lot of us overlook is that it was Nigerian youths who destroyed this country in 1966 going forward. What do I mean? The first set of youths who got us independence had international exposure. They knew what was in the interest of their people. Look at our world's sophistication and intelligence. Look at Zeke's sophistication and intelligence. Look at Samad Bello's understanding of the needs of the North, his attention to education, his attitude, even when people came for money for Hajj, he said, Hajj is for those who can, if you can afford it, go on your own resources and all of that. Now you come. Another set of youths took over. Think of the 1966 coup. What was the age of the person who overtook it, who carried out the coup? Who did he consult? And so you find that with that event and many other events for the following it, 
a new set of young people with guns who didn't have the knowledge, international exposure, understanding of national development involved, ran out, took over, and a lot has happened since then. Many of them are no longer here. Many more of them have grown into very old men. And so the young ones who look and say, oh, you see, is this older generation that denied, destroyed Nigeria? No, look back. What point am I making with that? When youth is not sufficiently informed about its environment, it doesn't understand, understand the paradigms of development and leadership and situates itself only within a grumbling platform, they will always think they can perform magic. And that's why working extensively with a lot of young people, I always tell them, seek knowledge. That's not the same thing as go, go and get a degree. Understand your operating environment. If you're going to become head of state today, you're going to run a country made up of many states, made up of many things. Can you do that? Can you treat a fire? And the, the way I, I sympathize much more with them is that you also have now an older generation that is not doing enough mentoring for the young, mm. that is employing them as PA and SA, and the only skill they have is to carry bag, and they are hoping to get into appointment somewhere. So the damage has become much more extensive. Leaders of tomorrow, yes. What are the paradigms of tomorrow? Is a 21st century world, is a VUCA world. The youths who are more visible than their colleagues, are they part of that world? Are they part of the consuming elite in Nigeria? You look around you, Kenya is in protest today. Should we have the number of senior special assistants we have in government at state and federal levels? Should we have this? So you find that the convoluted ex um, platforms, no, 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 structures and expenditures for public administration makes it impossible for genuine development to take place. Lagos was governed by Jack Conde. How many commissioners did he have? Did he have a single senior special? Look at what he did in four years. How many governors have been able to do that in eight years? You look across the country all over the place. Now the regions, the entire north is made of how many states now? More than 18. It was governed by one person with a certain number of commissioners. Now you have how many governors? Let's even assume it's 15. Of course, we know the actual number. How many commissioners? How many official vehicles? How many senior special assistants? among so many other things. That's part of the crisis of the Nigerian state, that we have bloated administrative structures for public administration, delivering less value, reading budgets, without on each occasion before the new budget asking, okay, last year's budget, how much of it did they deliver? Why is it on record that in most states of the Federation, you find that empowerment programs are going on, but for the last probably nine, 11 years, 40 or more percent of all the, those coming, coming for youth empowerment had taken part in previous empowerments. Government has become a drain on itself because the overall space has shrunk. So bringing it all around, the issue on the table is fairly simple. The political elite, the economic elite, the traditional elite are the ones who stand in greatest danger of demolition. Mm. If there is indeed the kind of process we are talking about. You know, just the point I'm leading to with this is that we are not exploring all the tears of government that are responsible for what's happening around them. What do local government chairmen to exi do, exist to do? Why are there councillors? Why are there what chairmen? What is their role? And when local, go local government gets a hundred million in a month and nothing happens, is that the fault of the presidency? So what I'm saying is fairly simple. The decay of a sense of service delivering, delivering leadership has permeated every strata of government. And that cannot end except there is some level of, you know, change of orientation. It will not come as a consensus at first, but it can be built into a consensus. First, among so many other things, but anybody hoping to make that happen today, without prejudice to the caliber of people involved and organizations, it will be a very, very tough sell. Mm. Governors will sit down today and agree with you to collapse their structures. Mm. Even if you say, okay, let there be a regional coordinator and the states will still be there. My question will then be, is that not another platform for expenditure? You want to create one more state. To create the state, you consult all the 36 states. The 21 assemblies will have to agree. How, who will agree to that? So I'm leading up to a very simple and straightforward point. Every attempt at a consensus must contend with interest benefiting with the status quo, benefiting from the status quo. 
Now, where the status quo is very entrenched and has the finances to undermine your own engagement, you can speak of consensus. But a good deal of the time, it will take force majeure, whereby a serious calamity or something leads to... And sorry, to, to switch this now. To, going to the June 12th, thing, yes, people will tell you that because Nigerian protested, that's why Babangida stepped aside. I take a contrary view. You see... You, when you, you, you can, to speak in military terms, he lost command. Abacha was more acceptable. Ab I mean, Babangida was not as rigid. He could be spoken to the artist. He was reconsidering. But the Abacha angle and was like, look, we don't want this. So the point being that every attempt at a consensus has the reality on the ground to contend with. And my question, throwing it back to all of us is, do you see the current Nigerian elite that approved, I think, there's something billion for a car park for the National Assembly, that approved all that money for interventions and re renovations in all the places, as a type of a leader who will sit down and do himself out of a job, an elite that has members who have spent 10, 8, 12 years in the Assembly, got constituency projects, the same elite that saw Bajabia Miller, go and look at what Bajabia Miller did in Lagos with his own money, the same people, the same kind of money they received, is what billions clear development intervention so imagine that all the others who were in the house with him who got the same amount with him also made interventions in their environment it would be a different ball game mm. summary there is a subsisting national consensus that consensus is a disposition to insensitivity to speech making to living in luxury and telling the people you're working for them but it's not all bad news the people imagine for instance you have a leader and that's why i say the critical role of this leadership should never be downplayed leadership signaling is often and most of the time a decisive index of what can happen and what cannot happen that is part of the issue on the table mm. is it true that some people in office today i hear many about majority got into their elective positions by means that are questionable in terms of the electoral process and i'm not talking even at the national level Look, um, um, state houses of assembly, governorship positions, etc. If the answer is yes, and you're saying it's government of the people, with all due respect, it's government of the people who put that government or that person in place. And they are the people he will work with and work for. That's number one. Number two, when I borrow two billion naira in order to get to the Senate, and I know that my entire entitlement while in the Senate will not be up to 1.5 billion, you know that for me is an investment I have to find whatever means exist on earth to recover that money. So I'm thinking of oversight functions where instead of oversighting whatever it is I've gone to oversight, I'll collect something and go. Now that's the environment within which we are operating. People will tell you, oh, this doesn't happen in America. And I tell them, this is not America. When you allow your own rights to be sold off upfront for 10,000, I gave you 10,000, you voted for me. You sold your very existence to me for the next four years. So you're worth 2,005 every year. The whole point of this is, let us first of all, admit the challenges of the human environment we are in. Admit the fact that the demands of the people make it difficult for genuinely intelligent leaders to emerge. Make it also clear that in spite of that, somebody can lead well. If we make these admissions, Another admission we must make is that our youths are being wrongly mentored by the political elite. And it will not take the presidency for me to go and start a youth program in my local government, mm. not my state. It will not take the IMF for me to know that there are things I can do that can become examples. I don't need my bishop to tell me that when I'm going to visit my mother, I don't need to go with a, a convoy of nine vehicles because I'm a public office holder. Because as you're doing that, you're doing unconscious mentoring of the elite, of the youth. Oh, that man, whenever he's coming, there are policemen with him. He's driving very fast. Nobody can approach him. I want to be like him when I grow up. Now, that's a new leadership culture that the youths, you say, are leaders of tomorrow. That's the kind of tomorrow you're forcing them to prepare for. Whereas in the past, these were, you look at a leader, his dignity is compelling. He's believable, etc. Those are the challenges and it's not by, and that's why I believe 
um, agencies like National Orientation Agency, yeah, people may say, oh, what is it doing? National Orientation Agency needs better funding. State agencies like that, but most importantly, leaders must show by their personal reflexes that at least they even had a proper upbringing. There's a way people behave in public. Ostentation, debauchery, those are not the things that define anybody in any culture, anywhere in Nigeria. So what is it that has happened to us? But instead of asking the question and saying, oh, it needs to be better, let everybody engage where it is. I run programs, youth programs, whatever you choose to call it. Let people engage where they are. Not gather in a big hall, air-conditioned, capacity of the hall, 300. You make a fine speech, which somebody wrote for you, by the way, and is reported in the paper, and somebody says, no, 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 that's not the way to go. Okay.